I'm coming down and I'm 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 armed and I'll I'll be down there tomorrow. And the analyst um, not only identified the report and referred that over for the threat management detectives to look at, but she went a step further and she actually ended up pulling up all of the flights. And we had detectives there to make contact with him. And we were, we were able to intercept that before he was ever even able to get to her. You're listening to 56, a Pinellas County Sheriff's Office podcast. I'm Ricky Butler, once again joined by my colleagues and co-hosts, Laura Sullivan and Ashley Cooley. We are the three curious but well-informed civilians you read about uh, in the description for this podcast that Laura wrote, which just hit me strangely. I'm like, that is fantastic. Yeah, you use that in, uh, in somewhere else, too. It, cu- cu- curiouser and curiouser, in fact. I, yeah. yeah. We are, I mean, we are curious. We yeah, are. but I'm not well-informed. I know that. That, I, that line I, wasn't for me. I don't think that's true. <laughs> Although it could be fun to have, like, curious and ill-informed. Yeah. Oh. Like, that would, the entertainment value would probably we, go Can we have an episode where we just ask the stupidest questions you could imagine? That's a that, day that might, for that me. That might be this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got, yeah, we got a heavy hitter in the room for this. So, anyway, uh, speaking of the podcast and uh, what it's all about, if you're listening for the first time, press pause and give episode zero a listen because we give you a lot of important context and who, what, where, when, why uh, about what we do uh, with this podcast. So, uh, first, thanks to everyone for listening to last episode with Deputy Anthony LaCourt. Uh, we just barely dipped our toes in the world of the Department of Detention and Corrections, which, as you may have learned last episode, is the biggest part of our operation. A lot going on. Had a great conversation uh, with Deputy LaCourt, who is FSA's and our 2022 Detention Deputy of the Year. So it was an honor to have him. And if you missed it, give it a listen. So getting started with this podcast, we wanted to make sure we at least began the first handful of episodes covering all the bases of the agency. So for all intents and purposes, let's say that we have three different types of employees here. We have law enforcement certified members, we have corrections or detention certified members, and then we have civilians, which is a majority. Uh, We're all civilians uh, on the podcast, but uh, overall for the whole agency, a majority of our employees are actually civilians, which I am always sure to mention when uh, speaking to uh, groups of high school students or college age students or young people. I don't like saying young people because I feel old when I say that because when I was (laughs) young, I mean, hey, you young people, like I don't want to do that. But anyway, when we speak to younger people and say, hey, you know, we're not just cops, we're not just uh, corrections deputies. A majority of our positions in pretty much every discipline you can imagine uh, on the civilian side do a lot of uh, really cool things, interesting things. So we've got accountants, mechanics, analysts, which we're going to talk about. So a lot of opportunity. So that was my HR plug. Anywho, uh, so we are checking the civilian box for this episode, and we have analyst supervisor Jacqueline Danzig with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for 56. having me. You're welcome. Thank you for answering our demanding emails to join us. (laughs) Um, A little bit about and and some context uh, about analysts and and, uh, because you're kind of a pioneer as far as PCSO is concerned. You started uh, when it was just getting started uh, years ago. But law enforcement historically kind of keeps information close to the vest, right? We're not necessarily, and I'm not talking about interagency, I'm talking, I mean, among agencies, I'm talking inside the agency as well, there, there's silos and they, they tend to kind of keep it there and there's, you know, walking the beat and boots on the ground policing and, you know, times are changing, technology's there and fortunately, uh, this agency has always been very progressive and wanted to try the latest and greatest things because back in the mid to early 2000s is when we kind of went down this path and that's of course evolved, which we'll talk to us about, but it's come a tremendously long way uh, and I think that all of our deputies and all of our members, uh, no matter what capacity, see the value that uh, intelligence-led policing brings. So, again, uh, Jacqueline, welcome. Uh, and let's just really briefly, so you are the analyst supervisor of the intelligence-led policing unit. That is me. Which is in the threat management section. Yes. Of the threat management division. Yes, we lacked a little creativity yeah. when we Some yeah, layers. when we made all that up. And threat management—that's a whole other topic. We'll probably get uh, we'll get we'll wrangle Captain Camacho probably at some time at some point to kind of go through all this because it's it's really exciting stuff. But I um, love that. 
Yeah. I'd love to talk to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sense that, uh, that you're getting back at him for something. That's fine. We'd love to talk to him, and, and we will uh, at some point. So talk to us. Um, How'd you end up here? How'd you get well, started? Oh, wait. Hold, yeah, hold yeah. On. Oh, wait. Oh, hold my gosh. On. Oh, oh, my gosh. Not oh, oh, the ice. Whoa. Do you see all this ice here? This like, solid there's so much ice. ice to be, I'm sorry. You know what? Wow. I was, I was on a roll. I apologize. Wow. Let me, let me back up. Jeez. Do a rewind. Wow. Ashley, as is the case with all of our guests that I've apparently forgotten after just three episodes, Ashley um, puts together a icebreaker question to kind of level the playing field. We will all answer the question as well, so you don't feel left out. But mm -hmm. Ashley, this is your time. I apologize. Really? Wow. Oh this is my last nice. show, guys. I'm out. Yeah. Oh, gosh. She's got paper. Well, yeah. I just huh. try to remember the details. Um, okay. So there's a new spot that is opening up in St. Pete that's called Good Night, John Boy, <gasps> which is a callback to that. the closing line from the 70s show, The Walton, or The Waltons, excuse me. And um, that show stirs nostalgia for quite a few people. And um, I'm just curious what shows are nostalgic for you. Like, what makes you think of simpler times being a kid? Mm. Oh, like I know it, it's going to take like yeah. a, a second or two to to think that through. I'm so, like, like all of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sigmund, you didn't watch Sigmund TV? the Sea Monster and what were the what? the Croft Superstars? Sigmund the Sea Monster <laughs> and the uh, what? And the boy with his magic flute. What was that one? You, you think I know? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping it's gonna take me a minute to get all the names back. I can sing the theme songs, but I'm not going to. Oh, please um, don't. And there's Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. Am I okay. really dating myself now? Uh, I, 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 um, <laughs> You're lost I, I for words. I have to, I have to tell you. No, I have to tell you, Laura. Like I, I grew up. Uh, I watched your typical Saturday morning cartoons, but I also always watched Nick at Night. Yeah. And I loved yeah. all the yeah. old shows. Yeah. Oh, so, so true. I am I am pretty versed on on a lot of the old shows, but I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Like yeah, not little even little boy in the flute. Not even close. Little kid in the flute, like Aqua Girl, whatever you just said. <laughs> what? Where Electra were Electra Woman and Dinah Girl? Electra. These are the Croft superstars. They 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 had this whole series of like five different shows. Is that um, like a Walmart brand superhero? I've what, no, what's that word you're saying before superstar? I think it's it's Croft, like K R O F T. I forget. I think they were the people, the producers, the people who made it. Okay. Okay. Now I have to remember the name like of the Like Laura Croft, now. Tomb Raider? No, but I think it's okay. <laughs> like, what, what? what channel was this on? It's just a standard channel. Was this but a movie? But it was like 10 or? years before you were born. Uh, again, I just tried to qualify myself a bit. with. <laughs> I just, uh, okay. What are they again? <laughs> <laughs> they were the Bugaloos, too. That didn't help me at all. The Bugaloos? They might have been old when I was a kid. I think they might be from the 70s and then... I was going to go with Mary Poppins, guys. Oh, okay, see, there, there we go. go. Let's, yeah. let's just go. pivot. We'll save Laura and we'll pivot. <laughs> there you go. Mary Poppins. I'm going to research these. I'm going to play some for you tomorrow. Please do. All right. So for me, it could be all over the place because if, if you're talking about like age appropriate nostalgia for me, uh, I watched a lot of like Dexter's Lab and Cow and Chicken. Yeah. Uh, however, I love all the old Hanna-Barbera cartoons, so Scooby-Doo, Jabberjaw, oh, all yeah. that nonsense. Uh, Tom and Jerry is my favorite. Oh, uh, I will yeah. still, uh, I think HBO Max has all of Tom and Jerry on it, and I would be lying if I said that if my wife is out of town, I may not pair, pour a cocktail and watch Tom and Jerry and just laugh, because <laughs> it's just, they're so violent, and we just laughed at it back then. Um, but on the Nick and Night side, like, all in the family. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that's a show that just couldn't exist today. Yeah, yeah. So, that's like my favorite show. That is oh, a good okay. one. I've watched yeah. a lot of that. Yeah, like kills me. I, I might day. have to. I'm gonna watch more now that you brought that yeah, up. See? Now that's back in my. All right, Ashley. Uh, I thought of a few answers, and then you reminded me about Nick at Night, and mm -hmm. I, I was big. I loved um, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, ooh, I yeah. love that. Um, and then. Maybe a little younger, watching stuff with my sister was like Power Rangers mm. and the Brady Bunch was on all the time, so we would watch that. And I remember watching like Jeff Corwin. Does that name ring a bell? Like it, it wasn't Crocodile Hunter, but oh, yeah. it, he was like a science yes, nature I yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I loved that stuff. Yeah. So I, all of those are kind of nostalgic. Yeah, I think for I me. think we just had a, a generational experiment because back then you only had those standard channels that I'm not sure if you get in America. <laughs> but we had options, you know, like we so many. we could we could watch the new stuff. We could watch the old stuff. And it mm -hmm. was like all on the same channel. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you it wake was. up, you wake up to the Rockford Files intro if you fell asleep watching whatever on Nick and I back in the day. So anyway, uh, or those, I, I or those CD compilations. You woke up and you stayed up too late, left the TV on 2 a.m. Oh yeah, and then that one guy on TikTok kills me with those. We're not supposed to talk about TikTok because China, but yeah. uh, I'm on TikTok all the time. Oh, of course. Uh, and that guy, there's a guy that does those like we just <laughs> out of a dead sleep, <laughs> like Celine Dion or something. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. I, I came from an era where a certain time of night the TV just stopped. Oh, just, right, just, right, oh. right. Like get the, the, the color bars. And the color that, bars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The snow. Oh, the I'm snow. glad. Well, it could have been worse. You could have said that was your favorite show. <laughs> <laughs> so that would have been even it more concerning. Me to sleep every I'm, night. Still, I'm still slightly concerned. Well, good question. And, and uh, I apologize again for forgetting about you completely. Um, that I, I don't know. I don't know Has what happened. Has this happened before? No. Oh, okay. No. It's just been, it's been a day, though. It's been a day. You guys yeah. have been busy. We have been. All right. Uh, can I, can we go back to her now? Yeah. Okay. No, really, I was fine. You guys should talk. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I know. All right, so, uh, <laughs> so how'd you get started in all this? How'd you end up here? Did you always want to be an analyst when you grew up? Is Ooh. that the plan? Do you want to go back that far? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, got my degree in criminology in 2005 from USF. Go Bulls. We have a USF, do the, do the bull thing. UCF, bull thing. Bull thing. See, I hit the wire. Hit the wire doing the bull thing. Yeah. Um, it's worth it. We have a USF, UCF rival, rivalry in the uh, office. So we've got more USFers than UCFers. So that's good. Uh, um, <clears throat> but <laughs> I've never heard Fers. Anyway, <laughs> that's all I heard twice. Uh, uh. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. Uh, so yeah, I graduated, and after graduating, I you know, saw this posting online, and I thought, hey, this is really cool. I can go like investigate crime scenes and you know dust for fingerprints and stuff. Mm. And, uh, put in my application and HR brings me in and they're like, hey, you know, we're going to have you sit in this room. We're going to have you read all these reports. And I'm reading through these reports and I'm like, why, why did, why do they care about mailboxes? Right. It's all these smash mailbox reports <laughs> and I can't figure it out. Don't really think much about it. I go to my interview. My interview is of course the panel interview that back then they didn't give you any warning. There's seven people sitting there and I walk. so intimidating. Oh God, it was awful. Right. You know, and yours wasn't that bad. There's, you know, everybody's crowded in the room and I sit down, they ask me all these questions and I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm done. I have no idea what this is. Right. They call me back uh, a couple, couple weeks later and they're like, Hey, you didn't get the job. I'm like, Hey, that's cool. You know, I appreciate the experience. My, my first, you know, interview in, in the real world. And, um, after that, a couple weeks later, I get a, I actually got the rejection letter. Did you know that HR sends you a rejection letter if you don't get it? Like, Hey, thanks. You suck. But, uh, <laughs> no. well, well, we've never been rejected. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, hey, we're, all, yeah. we're all winners. I can tell you what happened from here. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I didn't get no one. Yeah. They, they ended that. Oh. Yeah, I, um, I I can tell you that it hung on my refrigerator in my apartment, and I'm like, okay, well, I suck. I'm going to do better. And a couple weeks after that, they called me, and they're like, hey, do you want to do you want to you want to work at Pinellas County Sheriff's Office? And I'm like, well, yeah, heck yeah, let's let's do this. And turns out they had two positions. I came in as a crime analyst, but my focus was really in geographic mapping. So mapping crime incidents, looking at where the burglaries were occurring and looking at patterns and trends. And again, I was kind of like, well, when, when do we get to go out and dust for fingerprints? And so you still had no idea what job yeah, you were actually no, doing? No, I had no idea. You were taking, you were taking the, the title pretty literally. Yeah. yeah. Um, 18 years later, I still have no idea how I'm, I'm sitting in this seat, but I love it. It's, it's been fantastic. So I, um, I started a month after I graduated from college and it's been it's been a great ride ever since. So you wanted to be a vet, though. I did. I flunked out of it. I, I, did I you didn't, try? I did. I tried my hardest. So um, they have like tryouts with a thermometer or something. Yeah. Oh God, calculus is hard. Oh, calculus. Oh yeah. So yeah. I was a uh, I was a vet tech for a little while. Mm. Had fun dealing with puppies and kitties, and had this grandiose plan that I was gonna I was gonna save all the puppies and kitties, and mm. I was gonna adopt them all, and. Mm. Yeah. Kind of a state, let them run around. Yeah, and I got to got to biochem and got to the calculus programs. And calculus was fun. Biochem, not fun. Mm -hmm. Had a professor first day said, hey, look to the person on the left of you, look to the person on the right. That one's going to fail. That one's going to drop the class. Which one are you going to be? And I was like, ooh, this isn't going to go good. Um, I was the one that failed. So, <laughs> well, yeah, he was right. Uh, 
I was, uh, I, I, it was, it was better and, uh, went to a career counseling person, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And, um, they made me take this survey to figure out what would be the best fit for me. Was it USF? Yeah. Go Bulls. Just saying. (laughs) Go Bulls. Go Bulls. Bull thing. Uh, bull thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they were like, you like helping people. And I'm like, no, I really don't like people. I like, <laughs> I like animals. It's the puppies. Yeah, it's I want to help the puppies and the kitties. Right. And, uh, yeah, they were like, criminology, just go in criminology. And, yeah, it was really exciting. You know, you got to count the lumps on somebody's head or, yeah, no joke. Oh, if, like like 19th century phrenology? Yes. Like, you, if this, this was one of the criminal theories, right? If uh-huh. you have bumps on your head, you're yeah. going to be a, oh, a criminal. Yeah. And so I'm like, Ooh. Okay. Yeah, that used to be the science. They would feel the skull and you would have like the bump of aggression and the bump of, you know, curiosity. We have the bumps of curiosity, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course. Curious yeah. minds. All right. So unlike most people that are like, I grew up wanting to help people. For you, it was like, I want to deal with puppies and kitties, but let's count head bumps instead and welcome to PCSO. Yeah, so here I am. The, <laughs> the, I've never heard of that either. Have you but, heard of the head bump thing no, she's talking about? No, I've heard of the, the, the flat spot in the back of the head. For is little that, kids. Oh, okay. Um, from when I when is I that, taught, is that how they become criminals. Well, no, no, it just, it just, you, don't give them tough That's time. how you rehabilitate <laughs> them. <laughs> no, no. Oh, but like, kids, kids that watch too much tablet and watch too much TV, like they they develop a flat spot in the back of their head. Okay. Wow. And so. Mm-hmm. Put the suspect's mom so, on the stand and murder. Which he didn't, he didn't get enough tubby time. Yeah. Which, by the way, I I taught pre-K for. Um, a special needs pre-K for eight or nine years. That's so why that's you're so why, good with all of us. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, so in the early days, I would imagine uh, it, it's. I, I still think it's it's very new and up and coming as far as crime crime analysts and so forth. But, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was definitely up and coming. So, between you trying to figure out what you're actually doing, and everybody else trying to figure out what you're actually doing, what did that look like? Um, it was interesting. So my main role back then doing the mapping stuff, uh, I supported CompStat model, which we called ProStar back then. And it was great because I got to you know play with the latest technology. And it really, I, I quickly realized that it, it was cool in my eyes, but it wasn't really cool in the eyes of all of the commanders in the area. So I would take all of that crime data every month and I would put it on a map. And basically, I would have this nice little map on a, on a nice projector at the front of our old CPI office out at Honeywell. Mm-hmm. And all of the executive staff would come in, including the sheriff. The sheriff would sit at the head of this giant meeting table, um, Sheriff Coates at the mm-hmm. time. And they would start asking, why, why are all those burglaries there? What have you done about them? And what I, have you done about them? Oh, yeah. what have what have the executive staff done oh, about them? Okay. So got you've got nobody liked you then. No, oh. Oh. everybody hated me. You've got majors, captains who are you know trying to figure out you know what they what they could do. And it was always a running joke. We had one, I believe he was a lieutenant at the time, who would come in and say, "Well, it's because the kids are out of school." Well, it was you know middle of May, and the kids were definitely still in school, so it. It became a, j- a running joke there, but yeah, I lost a lot of friends in the beginning. Um, so, but just so we, just so I understand though, when you're talking about these maps, so you're you're taking uh, locations of certain types of crime, specific types of crime, crime in general, and you're basically dropping a pin on it. Yes. So we're looking at now we would call them patrol suppressible crimes. So not necessarily your, your violent crimes or your domestic violence cases, but more something where somebody driving by in a cruiser could do something about it, you know, where they might see somebody out there checking door handles mm-hmm. or if they are out on a traffic stop or a FIR, they can check backpacks and see, you know, if they have any burglary yeah. tools on them. Okay. So same, same thing, just we have fancier words for it now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you don't make a lot of friends. You're basically in there calling folks out on theoretically not doing your job because there's crime happening. Yes. <laughs> Nobody warned me about that. Right. And, and I, I guess there's probably a better time to say this, but, you know, when the sheriff talks about the future and technology and, and things, it's, it's always about it always comes back to threat management and intelligence led policing, because mm-hmm. obviously we 
if, if you see a deputy at your house or an officer at your house, it's, it's too late. The crime already happened. Yeah. The whole point is making sure we prevent the crime from happening, which it takes a lot more than just neighborhood watch and, and some of the other things that we do that are good and they have a place, but it, it's not this. So, you know, while that may have upset people back then, even Sheriff Coates back then said, well, why did they happen? How can we stop it? So, so how did it kind of evolve? So how did you, when did people start to say, hey, you know, maybe this, uh, stuff is helpful yeah like this is good to know this is good stuff what can we do it's with useful. It? it it honestly it started with the folks who we were directly helping who were the detectives at the line level at the time they were detectives and deputies and hey you know you might want to take a look at the suspect you know on this burglary hey we did see that you know we have this this pattern of burglaries have you looked at this guy um over the years those guys got promoted and they started going into sergeant spots and lieutenant spots and captain spots. And now those folks are the ones running the agency. So a lot of it is they just learned how to how to utilize us and what we do. And now we're we're with the recruits. So part of their initial onboarding is they spend four hours with me listening to how we can help them, how you know what technologies we have how we can make them more effective, and frankly, how we can make them look good and how we can get them recognition within you know, their jobs and make them more effective at what they're doing. And that's a good point. I never thought about that as, as far as those people back then that you were really yeah. helping, they've now moved up and that's, that's pretty cool. And I imagine that's how a lot of change and, and cultural changes will happen over time. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. So I, I know it, it, that seemed like, oh, well, just they eventually figured it out, but so initially back then, because because now, and, and we'll get into this in a bit, but but now, you know, there's an ILP tab on our intranet and patrol can access it. Everybody pretty much has access mm -hmm. to it and, and they have a means to, to use it. Um, but it was detectives mostly back then because, or, or how involved, like you're working just with investigative operations back then mostly, and then it kind of evolved or how did that, how did that go? Primarily, so we had a we had a similar setup to what we have now, where we did support patrol and we did support IOB as well, or investigative operations, and it was it was a good it was a good relationship that we had, where we could kind of work with both sides. But we were really embedded within burglary at the time, so we had analysts who were embedded within our South County burglary and our North County burglary. And we had a small small component of folks who kind of sat in a, a mini squad bay, but we were really small back then. And we only had so much technology to, you know, help us accomplish what we were setting out to accomplish, you know, preventing crime, you know, catching bad guys and, you know, really providing investigative assistance. So, right. Because, I mean, that just, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a, you know, 20 year deputy or a 25 year deputy in 2006 or 2007 when this new stuff is happening. It's just like, what? Like, you know, oh, yeah. this seems this seems crazy. So it so over time, people just kind of started to accept it more. When did because I'm sure I mean, it's not a great feeling not have. I mean, you're joking about it now, but kind of being the person like, oh, here comes, you know, the, that analyst girl to make us look stupid in front of the sheriff again. Like, <laughs> at, at what point did you start to, to feel like, hey, you know, this is, I, I'm okay with this. I like, you know, we're, we're really headed in the right direction now. We, and don't we, say like a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago. No. So um, we really, we started branching into new technology. And, and there were, there were, plenty of, of heated heated discussions that, that occurred where, you know, yeah, I, I was not I was not everybody's favorite favorite analyst. And as those as those detectives like, you know, we talked about as they as they moved up through the ranks, it really they started buying into it a little bit more. And we moved away from the pin on the map. And we started moving into what we call density mapping or hotspot mapping. Um, they always joked with it. And they're like, oh, look, there's the weather maps. You guys going to tell us if it rains today or not? Uh -huh. And we started looking at that and saying, OK, well, if they hit this neighborhood today, they didn't hit this neighborhood. Or, hey, they got $10,000 out of this robbery. We think that that's going to last him 
this long until he needs his next fix, until the bad guy needs his next fix. So that kind of allowed us to hone in a little bit more and provide a little bit more insight on where we thought that the next thing would happen. So we're big into what happened last year at this time, what happened last week, and kind of pushing that out there and getting that known. And let's be honest, they're really good. They know their areas. There's, there's not a deputy out there that doesn't know his area. He doesn't know his players. But what happens is we have shift change. Mm -hmm. We have folks who get sent up to investigative operations. They get promoted to be a detective. They get promoted to go into supervision. Mm -hmm. that, that knowledge of that area leaves with that person. Mm -hmm. right. And we really are tasked with making sure that that information that left with that person who got promoted is passed on. And, you know, our goal is to make sure that it's a seamless transition across all shifts, especially now. Back then we were, we were three shifts um, with five day a week um, regular, regular schedule versus our, our 12 hours now. 12 hours has helped us out a little bit where we're only covering two shifts, but there was a lot of information loss. And you know, there was a lot of silos where we had burglary who worked on their burglaries and we had robbery homicide who de dealt with solely robbery homicide. And there wasn't a whole lot of consideration to how that bled over into the two. And, you know, certainly as we sat in seat longer and longer, criminals are criminals. They're, you know, a bad guy's a bad guy. He doesn't care if it's a burglary. He doesn't care if it's a robbery if the opportunity is there, he's going to act upon that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For a, you, you mentioned being embedded and, and for a long time, that's sort of how it was structured. And I wanna get into, to give everybody an understanding of what kind of information you provide and, and how you gather it and organize it. But it, intelligence led policing showed up on my radar uh, a handful of years ago, because I think if I ask you when the shift happened and the momentum change happened, I think we're talking about the same period of time mm -hmm. when the intelligence-led intelligence policing unit uh, kind of became a thing. It wasn't always under threat. Right. Um, but when that came together, is that is that about when the game changed? Yeah, that was that was huge change for us. That was where we really we we had we had momentum and we were gaining speed. But that really that shifted us into overdrive. And that was obviously the sheriff's doing. Um, so let's talk about that and what that structure looked like. So you, you took all the, basically all the analysts that were embedded, everybody kind of came un, with, under the same umbrella to a degree. Of course, you still have folks that are embedded, but, but what did that structure look like? How did y'all gather information? What kind of information did you start putting out? So before we brought everybody under one umbrella, we had folks all over the agency. We had folks within narcotics, we had folks in burglary, and we had folks in, um, at the time, our, our special victims unit, and everybody was doing stuff a little bit differently. Everybody had a different chain of command, and they had the same job description, but everybody's training was a little bit different. Everybody's day looked a little bit different. And we wanted to provide a consistent product across the board. Uh, in addition, we weren't we weren't really streamlined enough where we were able to pull all the information from the agency into a single place. And when we, when we brought ILP up, it was about seven years ago now, bringing everybody into one place and bringing all that information into one place allowed for a clearinghouse. It was no longer, you know, robbery homicide gets, gets this bulletin and hey, did they, did they pass it along to the right people? Did it get pushed out? Or burglary gets some information from over in Tampa. Did that, did that make it out to patrol? Does that need to go to patrol? It now comes to one central place where a common set of eyes looks at it. We look for connections to our area and then we push it out, you know, based on what the needs and the patterns and the trends are within Pinellas County. And something I always thought was cool was you guys met every day. Every day. So everybody, whether, and, and just to be clear, you mentioned the embedded analysts, but then there are other, what, what do you call them? Are they patrol analysts? Or are they just kind of general analysts that, they have um, analysts that are assigned to different patrol squads, right? Yes. Okay. So, so that's so, how we started out. Okay. You, you're bringing all of the uh, embedded analysts that are throughout the agency, and then you have the patrol analysts, if you will. They're each assigned to a squad, and the way patrol is organized, um, just 
for context is that there are geographical areas called squads where they patrol. So you have an analyst for each squad. You have the embedded analysts that come in-house. Uh, you're all together, and you talk every day. What does that conversation sound like, look like? Um, every, every day we, we meet up. Sometimes we, we actually mix it up a little bit for COVID to sure. make it a little more interesting. We did some theme Zoom calls mm -hmm. to make it interesting. We, we talked about our favorite ice cream. We had a... Um, we had an ice cream bracket to see what the what the favorite was. Uh, Rocky Road, by the way, if anybody's tracking. Oh, really? Okay. Wasn't my Rocky favorite, Road. but I'm just That's saying. That's surprising. Um, but really what the dynamic of that call that that we have, we all we all get on, the embedded folks get on, plus those those squad analysts sit down and the goal is to to share information. A lot of times we'll have the the narcotics analyst who is working a case that really bleeds over into the squads. Or maybe we have the burglary analyst who's working a pattern that's occurring in other jurisdictions. So she may know of a retail theft ring that is coming to our area. And by having that conversation, she knows that, hey, we just had Alta hit. And, mm -hmm. you know, hey, we, we've got some stuff going on. So now that means that 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 group has actually come into our area and now she needs to start working with those detectives. So it's really, it's an opportunity for us to all sit down, get on the same page, know what everyone's working on. And then we have each of those representatives from those specialized units who can go back and say, hey, FYI, we had this come in on patrol. Um, detect detectives are good about seeing the reports that come in, but we're reading every report. So even if it's a completely unrelated report to a burglary, we're still reviewing it. And, you know, we can make that determination, hey, this was an FIR, but it was an FIR in the area of a burglary. This could be a suspect for you. What's an FIR? Field interview report. Okay. So a uh, quick consensual contact that uh, law enforcement has with, with someone. Um, occasionally they'll document a report for us and document that contact of, you know, who, who they were with and what time they were with them. Okay. So that would be a situation where uh, if a deputy, you know, a call came out for a suspicious person, deputy stopped and talked to them. They may not have been the guy we were looking for or girl, but we have a conversation with them and document it. And actually, if you remember back to That's the first episode of the podcast, the we talked case. about the one cold case yep. we cracked was because Fally of a, had yeah, done. deputy okay. Fowley did a very thorough uh, FIR. So. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. So you guys read every report? Every report. Every offense and incident that comes in. So if there is a case that's, that's documented by, by any of our deputies or any of our law enforcement folks, we're reviewing it and taking a look at it to see what significance it has on, on operations. Is it something that we need to get out to investigative operations? Is it something that patrol needs to know about? And really, do we need to send it beyond Pinellas County Sheriff's Office? Because we don't just partner just with analysts within our agency. We're, we're looking at the region as well. So we have great partnerships with all the agencies around the area and great communication back and forth with, with each agency. So what does a day in the life of an analyst look like then? You, you come in, you got your coffee, uh, maybe in your fancy Stanley cup or your Yeti cup. Diet Coke. Okay. Uh, and uh, you come in, you start your day, is everybody just picking up reports? So, so I guess the analysts that are associated with squads, they're reading the reports from their squad. Is that the first thing you're doing in the morning is reading your reports? First thing we're doing. So there's, there's no two days that are the same. Um, obviously, you know, just, just like patrol sees, there's always something new that's coming in. But yes, they, they come in, sit down, and their first goal is to knock out all of the offenses and incidents that came in for, for their squad. What, so th what do those numbers look like? How many? We are looking at about, about 150 a day that, that they're reading. We were actually around about 70,000 last year that oh, we boy. read total. So it's, it's a big number, and it, it's, it's a significant amount of our time that, that we're using but it, it really gives us that bang for the buck to, you know, to look through everything and, and leave no stone unturned. Yeah. And really before, before threat management, our, our goal was to look at those patterns and trends within burglaries. You know, did we have a, a retail theft ring that was kicking up where, you know, we needed to work with loss prevention folks? And now we've transitioned into 
the threat management side of it where we're looking at folks who are are on the pathway to violence. So we have set criteria that the analyst is looking at. They are the first set of eyes on that report to determine if there's anything concerning within the report. And if there is, they're going to forward that over to our threat management sergeants for them to take a look at. And if the sergeants agree that, you know, this is something of particular concern and it meets our criteria, it's going to go to a detective for the detective to go ahead and, and work that case. So there are a lot of things, what is what I'm hearing, that they're looking for when they look at these reports. So let's just, because we're going to talk a lot about threat management, but let's just kind of yeah. go back to the retail theft ring or, or things, maybe have some vehicle burglary trends, which is a whole other big topic. Mm -hmm. What happens, what happens, so as you're reading through your reports, do you just start pulling those, setting them aside, and then kind of see how many you have? Like, what does that look like? I like it that you just made a paper reference. Right. Like, we're doing this all via paper. <laughs> well, listen. Well, yeah. I mean, what else? You never have how it is in my head. I'm, I know able, it's, yeah. I'm <laughs> able to make fun of Laura for talking about stuff. I have no idea what she's talking about because she's older. But I can also do the paper thing. So that's yeah. how I stay balanced out. You know? Yeah, there's no paper. Send me a no fax. Yeah. 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 There's no fax machines. So you're, you're flagging whatever word you want to use. You're, yes. you're identifying these reports that we need to look at closer. Yes. So we have we have this really cool website that we have a really good IT department and they they created a a web page for us that is on the the main agency page where we can push out information to patrol. If it's something that we think, you know, patrol needs to know about maybe because shift change just occurred or just because a shift was on yesterday and b shift is on today or maybe it's a day shift midnight shift problem we can push that out and we can say hey guys you know we've we've got some issues here at at this location we may have surveillance images that go with it we can post all that so it's it's live right there we're 24 hours behind and it's all there and available for them to to look at and read through Plus, they have historical. So mm. I don't know about you guys, but occasionally I like to go on a vacation, right? Mm -hmm. So I've heard of those. Yeah, yeah, me too. I haven't done one in a while. <laughs> but um, they can, if they're, if they're out of the office for an extended period of time, they can go and look back historically to see, you know, what, what occurred over the previous week. Or if they're driving around and they do have a suspicious person that they're making contact with and, you know, maybe they're in a specific type of car and they remember that they read something about a specific type of car. They can go back and search all of our notes to to see what's actually gone on with that vehicle. So then on the on the other side of it, because um, I'm trying to just there's a lot to talk about with threat management, mm -hmm. but on this just kind of basic crime, normal, normal crime piece uh, as a deputy, then you come in, you start your shift, you can pull all this information that, that you guys have compiled. And, and like you said, I mean, you've been away, you can pretty much get up to speed on what's going on. Yeah, so we we have it all in a nice packaged little web page. We we kind of we call it our one stop shop. Not to be cliche, but they have what occurred over the previous twenty four hours that the analyst has deemed significant. So we're not inundating them with you know a a baloney ordinance violation. You know yeah. we're we're looking at stuff that's important to them and pushing that out. But we also have all of their warrants on the page. Mm -hmm. So all of the active warrants. So that are in the area geographically? Yes. Okay. So yeah. anything that is active, they they have a picture, they have an address, and they have an address that's coming out of our court system and they have what the charge is. So if it's a failure to appear they can quickly notate, hey, I, I know that this guy is at 123 Main Street and I'm, I'm right down the road. Maybe maybe I'll swing by. Stop you know. by and check in. Yeah, maybe he's out mowing the grass. You, know, you never know. So we we want to, to make it to where it's easy for them to use. It's a convenient place. And again, we, we want to make them look good. You know, my, my goal is not, it's seriously not to be sitting in front of this camera. I, I want them to be sitting in front of this camera and talking on this mic right now. Uh, but, you know, I want them to get the glory of, you know, having that successful arrest. If I can, you know, if I can do anything to support patrol and, you know, have the analysts have that positive outcome, that's that's what we're here for. That's all about. Um, all right. So vehicle burglaries, because that is uh, conveyance burglaries is the number one crime in Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. Lock your car doors, please. Yeah, just it's it seems simple, but. 
Especially if your firearm's in the car, please. Right. Well, yeah, don't leave your firearm in the car, number yeah. one. That's yeah. a yeah. must to secure it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a huge part of, of what y'all do. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, y'all spend a lot of time uh, working on it, because I'm glad y'all are working on it, because you can probably try to give the deputies the tools they need to, to try to combat it a bit and the information. But it's like got to be, it's got to be like playing whack-a-mole. But some oh. of these individuals that are doing it are, are pretty well known to you. I'm sure you could rattle some names off of some of some repeat offenders. So talk to us a little bit about about that and I guess how you approach it, knowing that even though it's a very easy thing to prevent, it's never going to go away. Like, what's the, how do y'all handle that? It's job security all yeah. day. Uh -huh. since, mm -hmm. since 2006, the, we, have, we have been dealing with this issue. We have, we have a lot of cool programs that, that patrol does. Um, they used to do these little brochures that they'd go around and drop them in the cars and, mm -hmm. you know, hey, you left your car door unlocked. Uh, we're the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. Please lock your car door. And, you know, that you know, certainly has its educational impacts, but it's, it's, it's going to continue, especially now that, you know, back in my day, mm -hmm. we, you used to have a, have to have to have a key, right? Mm -hmm. And you had to find the key, you had to put the key in the ignition, you had to turn it. Now they just sit in the driver's seat of the car, put their foot on the brake and hit the ignition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The push to start technology, it's, it's just, it's amplified the, the issues that we're having with, burglaries and those burglaries are now turning into grand theft autos right. and those grand theft autos are then turning into we're now chasing a fleeing signal 10 or a stolen vehicle and now we're we're endangering you know people or the bad guys endangering people by mm -hmm. you know us trying to get those folks you know off the road and get them into custody and, and i think that's the that's the part that people miss and we still do the uh educational uh brochure drop by the way uh, occasionally because we hear about it uh, upstairs on the PR side because it makes it makes people uh, unhappy it makes some right. waves it, it, it gets some <laughs> attention uh, but uh, that's that's sort of the uh, it's something first of all I mean you can have a deputy sheriff lock your car or someone else get into your car and take your stuff but what you just said is is so important for people to understand I mean you're you're pulling resources needlessly because you can't lock your car and it could turn into i mean people really don't understand this matrix of, of how those progress into different things mm -hmm. uh because you have groups of of folks often juveniles they'll steal one car and they'll just go from neighborhood to neighborhood and I mean, how many serious crashes happen, you know, involving stolen cars? We just had the, the Maserati a few months mm -hmm. ago. Uh, we have we've had several high profile incidents in the county with juveniles stealing cars. And it's just the most preventable crime. And listen, I mean, people people make mistakes. You mentioned the new technology. It's, it's new to people. People don't always realize that you have you get two keys to your car and maybe it's in the glove compartment or something. You never knew about it, it the, or about the valet keys and things of that nature like there's of course the educational component but we get nightlies not as detailed as the ones y'all get but i look at the nightlies of what went on the night before every morning and there's at least a handful every morning uh, my favorite is well i left it unlocked because i didn't want them to break the window yeah <laughs> uh well now your car's totaled you know down and down on south side and right we we got nothing for you you probably could have just dealt with the window and and seven times out of ten it's a crime of opportunity so there are very i mean i can i can count on on my hands and my toes so far this year how many uh actual smash and grabs there have been in the county it's just a crime they're just trying door handles because it's too easy oh it's way way too and easy it's locked, they just don't bother they just move on right. to the next one yeah yeah um so there was a big, uh, and I, I want to say it was probably about the time ILP came together. That's intelligence pleasing. ILP came together um, back in 2016 is about the time we were having the epidemic of vehicle burglaries to the point that, well, the Tampa Bay Times did a big story on it, uh, but then uh, the sheriff, as usual, steps up to solve the problem. Um, and I don't say that because he signs my paycheck. I just say it because it's true. There's a lot of things that come up that everybody just kind of stands there and goes, I don't know. And then the sheriff's like, all right, well, we're going to handle it because we have to deal with it anyway. We might as well try to be proactive. So the home unit, which is the Habitual Offender Monitoring in Enforcement. Enforcement Task Force. I feel like I should just throw another force in there for fun. But that's the... 
deadly force task force force uh, force. The use of deadly force. Force use force. of deadly force. Investigate anyway. Yeah. A lot of task forces. It's a. Um, anyway, so we come up with that, which is essentially a joint effort with several agencies, because which is al also a fun uh, also a, a fun dynamic for folks when they when they're visiting here they're coming from other parts of the country up north and it's like wait a minute you're in the smallest county most dens dens densely populated county in the state it's one of the smallest states and you guys have 11 different law enforcement agencies mm -hmm. so working together on some of these things that are, are issues of county-wide concern are really important so this task force comes together and I don't know exactly what the number is, but in order to be a juvenile uh, on this on this list, if to even be on the task force's radar, you have to have had a what I, as a normal person, would call an absurd amount of absolutely criminal absurd activity. Moment. Yes, uh, to be on this list. So, and this was a critical time, I, if I remember right, with uh, ILP kind of helping with this. And you have embedded analysts there as well. Yes. But these are essentially assigned deputies or officers from around the county that have a list of offenders, and they essentially babysit them. Yes, they do. So we have some folks who are on electronic monitoring, where we're monitoring where they're at at all times. We have folks who are on curfew, and those deputies and officers go out and check on those kids, make sure that they are where they're supposed to be. The analyst role is really keeping track of them. There's hundreds of, of kids on this. I want to say our last count was somewhere around 200 kids that are on this list where, you know, we need to keep track of them. And they're coming in and out of the juvenile system. So they're, they're going in for their initial arrest, and then they're getting some sort of a sanction. Maybe, maybe they actually have to stay within a facility, or maybe they have, you know, a curfew for a period of time. That's where the analyst is really coming in and, and following those court dockets as, as those offenders progress through their, their sanction, making sure that they complete their sanction and making sure that, you know, we're, we're keeping track of, of where they are. It's, it's amazing how many, they, they don't care about the sanctions. They don't, they don't care about, you know, it's, it's a lifestyle for them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's all they know. That's all they've grown up with. And, Frankly, they, they're just like, hey, when, when can I go out again? When, it, when can I get to this? Week? And un unfortunately, by tracking those court docs, you know when they're coming out of whatever sanction they had, you will expect to see them again. Oh, absolutely. We had, um, we had one a couple years back who I actually got to sit and listen to his, his first appearance. And he had stolen, he had burglarized a couple of cars, had stolen a vehicle, and he was not even, there's no way he could reach the pedals. I swear he had to have had a phone book. And do, How they, old was he? do they still make phone books? Mm -hmm. um, he was, I believe he was 13 at the time. Wow. And uh, he had, he had stolen a high-end vehicle and uh, that's what they focus on. They always, they want to go to the high-end neighborhoods and they want to get the, you know, the nicest car to drive down and take a, you know, take for a spin and half the time they completely trash the car. And, 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 and is it, is it just to take the car literally just to drive it or go to take it to commit other crimes or do they, there's not like high level, uh, uh, like brackets of no they just want to have fun they're no, kids no, right, right. Eastern right. Europe hey, check out this okay. check out this porsche that i just uh, yeah. i just yeah. boosted this yeah. isn't like gone in 60 seconds they're just out they're yeah. out messing around yeah. okay. i knew i worked with someone um and her son was doing this at 13 years old mm -hmm. and she and he kept going into G, uh, the juvenile detention center and she she didn't know what to do and she was like just keep him keep him i don't know what to do and i just felt for her because yeah, it is a situation, what? and of course you have people say, well, you know, what about the parents? You get to a point where, you, and, and if I remember right, um, and I should be careful saying this, but if I remember right, the, a majority of the kids that are in, I probably shouldn't call them kids, but they are kids, that are in under the home unit's supervision, their parents are, are quite cooperative with it. I mean, they're pretty happy about it yeah. uh, because they've, they've, yeah. they're have they've at the end of the uh, rope, if you, if you will, uh, as far as how they can, can control them. Uh, and so we also had the other, so we had, I mentioned earlier, we had some significant uh, news making incidents with juveniles and stolen stolen cars we had one uh, the first one was the three um, three girls that ended up in the pond uh, and then after that we had another one and I believe it was one of those juveniles that survived that crash is still at it absolutely he um, 
he came out um, was involved in a, a serious serious crash um, they had they had just burglarized um, a neighborhood that was up in our, our north area which is is a hotbed there's a lot of nice cars up there a lot of high-end vehicles um, they all they all came up in a stolen uh, police interceptor that they had pulled off of a it was actually off of a car lot and they were going through the neighborhoods and we we knew that we were having the problem so we had we had patrol in the area they were actively you know looking for stuff like this going on and happened to see the vehicle and it was a it was a big cat and, cat and mouse game they were attempting to get patrol to pursue them and we actually re, we released body or not body cam um we released a video from the cruiser of that incident you can see them accelerating and decelerating and trying to entice the deputy to chase them and they ultimately blacked out the car, turned out all the lights, and went through the intersection of uh, US 19 and Tampa Road um, in excess of 100 miles an hour and hit a vehicle, um, innocent bystander there that was affected by that. And when they hit the vehicle, it actually um, caused, the, caused the police interceptor that they were in, it was an Explorer, um, to explode. And all, all four of them flew out of the vehicle. Between the four of them, they had over 150 charges for various crimes. Before this incident? Before, yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, three of them passed on, on scene that night. And um, one of, one of the, the kids in the car uh, survived. And he, you know, he watched his friends, his cousin, his family members uh, perish right there on the side of the road. And... He went to the hospital himself as soon as he was out of the hospital and had made his way through the juvenile court system. He's back at it. You know, so it's, crazy. it's, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's all they know. It's, it's all they want to do. They, they see the opportunity and, you know, they see an easy way to get their hands on something that they don't have the ability to get. They don't have the right. ability to get to. Which is why the emphasis is just lock your doors. It's it's not a it's truly an issue that is out of control, and we can't. There's no logic there. You know, people people that are on the outside looking on a lot of the things that we deal with regularly uh, that we see firsthand uh, up in PR is just yeah. I mean, a duh. If it was that easy, we would do it. But the easier solution here, because since you're not going to get through to a kid that watches three of his friends and or family members get killed is going to be back at it again. You're not, you can't work with that. There, there's no reasoning with that. So that's, um, hmm. that's insane. It is. And, and it's, we did a lot of, uh, social media and a lot of, we did a big media blitz with that when that oh, happened. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even because we actually posted, I think with, with that young man, I think we posted a flight video of him getting arrested again after that it happened oh yes yes we did and um you just i can't like I, I as the kids say these days i can't even i literally know, can't even i literally can't even i don't know what that means but all right so auto burglaries big one predictable somewhat because you know who some of these these people are uh, that are doing it you can track it but let's get into the, um, the threat management piece. You know, we, I know you're getting excited now, <laughs> yeah. because that's kind of the latest uh, evolution, I guess, if you will, uh, is that uh, ILP kind of came together seven years ago, whatever it was you said, rocked and rolled for a while. Then the shooting in Parkland happened, the sheriff had that role there um, as the chair of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission. And that got the wheels turning again and, and put some things in motion. I would say it would have happened anyway, but a little bit faster. Oh, yeah. So the, the one thing that, that we all see uh, anytime you have some sort of a mass casualty incident or anything, anything just terrible that happens, really, uh, is if there's a bad actor. Well, how many times had long, I mean, you can, unfortunately, unfortunately now, almost every day you can turn on some major news network and or, or go online and see a press conference occurring with some whether it be elected officials law enforcement officials whomever providing some sort of an update telling you about the history and the background of this person that has done this egregious thing and everybody sitting at home myself included goes how many, how, how 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 do we not 
communicate this? How do we not take action on this? How can you have, and, and there are legitimate reasons why it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. but the layperson asks the question, why? How, how, how did this happen? How did they not pick up on this, 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 or that? Mm -hmm. So the threat management, uh, as it kind of started here at the Sheriff's Office a few years ago and has morphed and is now a division, tries to get ahead of that. So talk to us about that latest evolution. Oh, it's fascinating. It's uh, it's been it's been a really, really fun times. So it's taken it's taken the analyst from a kind of a a responsive role on hey this is what happened, and it's putting us into a little bit more of hey this is what we think could happen. There's something concerning here. Previous to this, you know, we read these reports, and this was the biggest complaint of, of all the analysts. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times an analyst would come to me and say, hey, this, this guy's going to kill somebody one day. And it's like, well, okay, you know, send that to robbery homicide. And robbery homicide would be like, hey, you know, it's, it's not really in our wheelhouse. It's, it's not something that we would look at. Oh, okay, well, hey, send it to the intel unit. Well, the intel unit, yeah, that's not really what we deal with. And we constantly struggled with where, where do we send these people? You know, is it a patrol function? Is it an I, or an investigative operations function? Where, where do those lines of delineation, where are they? And this has really put us into the driver's seat now. And, you know, as, a, as that analyst is reviewing those reports, they're looking at, you know, hey, there's, there's something concerning here. And now it's not a guessing game of where does it go? We automatically know. We we have the partnerships with the detectives where we can say, "Hey, this is this is going directly over." You know, I'm if it's egregious enough, we go over and have a direct conversation. Hey, this is something you guys need to look at right now, or you know, it's going to go over and have a second set of law enforcement eyes on it to say, "Hey, this is this is of concern, and you know, we should proceed forward with it." So it's really it's been rewarding to to see that progression and you know that's that buy-in that's continuing with the position it's you know it's not something that if if you would have asked me 18 years ago when i started you know hey do you really think that the analysts are going to be in the driver's seat the first the first line of you know reading these reports and understanding what's going on i would i would have told you no no way I, we're gonna we're gonna continue to get abused. They're, they're gonna hate us, right? <laughs> what what right. was it that somebody called you when you first started? Oh yeah, I was an overpaid data entry clerk. That was fun. Yeah. That oh. I, I cried that night. That was embarrassing. Uh -huh. Yeah, nothing like uh, being told you're an overpaid data entry clerk in the middle of a read off in front of uh, a bunch of a bunch of detectives and deputies. But that's, that's almost as bad as forgetting an icebreaker question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oof. almost, yeah. almost, almost. Oh. I'm gonna be hearing about that for a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well. Um, Whenever I post about the threat management division section, um, even ILP, what ends up coming up a lot in the comments from some people that aren't informed is that they think it's something to the effect of like predictive policing. Um, they find it to be big brother. Um, and that's not what you guys are, are doing. You're not like targeting a certain neighborhood because you think this. Um, you have data from reports that you're seeing that are that's already telling you that this person has done this and this and this, and we've seen that it leads to here. So we need to intervene. Yeah, we are we are the farthest thing from a a predictive policing. So we're really depending on you know, what, what's written in the report. Mm -hmm. So what, what occurred in the law enforcement contact? So if law enforcement isn't involved, we don't know. I don't, I don't have some secret crystal ball that, you know, we bring out every night and, you know, look at it to see, oh, okay, hey, this neighborhood, this time, you know, we've, we're, we're going to have something occur. Yeah. We, we depend on, the partnership with the community and our partnership with patrol operations to know what's what's going on out there you know we we sit behind a desk we're not in we're not in the field we we have the advantage now of you know being able to watch body cam where we have a little bit more of a glimpse of what's going on within those calls but we depend on that report and that report is a historical snapshot of of what went on in an incident so no, there's there's no crystal ball that you know that we're looking at. There's no there's no predictive piece to this. It it is still very much you know what what we had going on in the facts and circumstances at that moment in time. Yeah. 
So, and we could probably do an entire podcast just talking about threat management, and we're not going to do that uh, yet. But uh, <laughs> you, you're, so your analysts are kind of the, the same question I asked earlier with a lot more uh, seriousness attached to it uh, or potential seriousness. Uh, they're reading through report. You see somebody that you're concerned about. You now can actually take action on it. Like what are some of the tools that you all have? Uh, and when I say you all, I mean just threat management in general or the agency. Uh, when you identify, so can you give us an example? Oh yeah, so um, we have we have a plethora of tools available to us. So first and foremost, the the analysts on the ad initial identification piece, they're they're the first line, they're the first set of eyes. Once we get past that and we start the the detective piece of it, where we actually bring a detective and we have a an investigation that occurs as a result. Um, there's a, a threat assessment that is actually conducted. And it sounds like a really big and intimidating word, but it's really us going through and looking at law enforcement contacts. Again, there, there's, no, there's no crystal ball. There's nothing that we're going into these secret databases on. The, this is all information that's, that's available through law enforcement systems and publicly available information. And on that specific person? Just that person. Yeah. And, okay. you know, we're looking at, you know, what, what's going on, what's, what's occurring in the household, what is occurring, you know, with previous law enforcement contacts. And we paint a picture for the detective on what they can expect. And a lot of times it comes in at the surface, you know, where, eh, hey, there's, there's something that this guy said that's a little bit off. And then we, we start peeling back the onion, so to speak, and it, it gets, gets a little wild. Um, one of the cases that, that we have that kind of started out, eh, hey, we might, we might have something here. Guy walks into a, a firehouse subs, strikes up a conversation with one of the employees, you know, hey, I'm, I'm stunt double. Okay, sounds pretty cool, right? Call me, they exchange phone numbers. Pretty cool. They start conversing, they have a conversation, and she gets a little uncomfortable with the conversation. She tells him, hey, I'm, I'm good. She actually blocks him. And he, he comes back and starts talking to her again on a different number this time. And she tells him again, hey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in this, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And he starts making demands, you know, hey, you're, you're gonna tell me why you blew me off and you're gonna, you're gonna provide me with an explanation or else. And he starts giving these ultimatums to her. And, you know, on the surface, that could be something that's, that's very innocuous where, you know, he's, he's just being a jerk. You know, we see it a lot of times with kids where they get, you know, they get vengeful and spiteful and, you know, they wanna have the last word. Mm -hmm. And this is one that came over and we started, started peeling back that onion on it. And this guy had done this numerous times. Um, he was living out of his car, had movie props, horror movie props oh. in his car. And one of the text messages progressed to um, how he was going to gut her and got extremely explicit on how he was going to harm her. Wow. And it was, it was one of those where we quick, quickly went, hey, we've, we've got a much bigger problem than what we initially anticipated. Harassing phone calls are, you know, are one thing, written threats to kill mm -hmm. and progressing into a, you know, a felony charge. That's, that's something where, you know, we're, we're gonna take that on and take a serious look at it. Sorry, wow. that got deep. No, I, just, <laughs> no, I wasn't ready for that. So uh, what are you able to do in a case like that? So in, in that particular case, we, we have a, a ton of different resources. We have a, the detectives have relationships with numerous internal partners and external partners within the sheriff's office. So we have our child protection. So if it's something that involves a, a child or you know, a juvenile of any kind, we can, you know, work with with our child protections to, you know, get them services. We also, in in this case, we have a relationship with our state attorney's office, and it's one of those where we can work with the state attorney to ensure that, you know, we we have the due process there. We we make sure that we cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's on our investigations. Um, in this case, it, it resulted in arrest. That's not our goal. At, at all times, our goal is really to 
to find a way to get that individual back to kind of a normal train of thought, get them off that pathway to violence, mm -hmm. make them, you know, help them to find healthier decisions. We partner with our mental health unit where, you know, they can provide services as well, get them connected with clinicians and get them help that way as well. And I think that is the far as the goal is not always an arrest. The goal is to, to kind of get the situation uh, under control. That is different. That's not normal. No, it's, it's a struggle it, for yeah, them to it, learn. It's, but as far as our role and what we're doing, that, that does set it apart from other things, is that we're going to deal with an issue when it happens, but when you mm -hmm. start to try to flip the script and, and, and try to prevent the violence or, or whatever, the, something from happening, and it's like, yeah, you know, I think when we were, I forget who I was talking to, but was, we did a, a good episode of Partners in Crime on this, uh, but you have a detective show up at your door, that really isn't there or doesn't really have charges of, uh, on you. They, they just want to talk and they want to have a conversation and, and try to get a handle on what's going on. That's different. You know, a lot of times it's, hey, you want to talk to us? You know, you're, you're obviously, you may be a suspect or a subject. You know, you're thinking, why are they here to talk to me? But this is, they're just trying to get information and, and you can tell them, no thanks, have a nice day. And they turn around and leave. Yeah. And, and we're not talking to just the bad guy. We're, right. we're talking, talking to everybody. everybody. You know, yeah. we, we want to get to know the family because a lot of times the family has the inside scoop, right? They they know when something's off. They know what what normal behavior is and abnormal behavior is. So we really depend on the family to, to give us, you know, information and family and friends, you know, hey, is, is something off? So what are some of the other tools that we that y'all have at your disposal? So... One of the tools that we have is, is risk protection orders. So that is something, as ILP progressed, and we started out you know, with, with just reading daily reports and reporting patrol suppressible crimes, risk protection orders was, was something that was brought on. And it really started our process and, and our, our involvement in threat management. So early on, uh, risk protection orders are, they're a tool for, for law enforcement and for the court system when when we have someone who is a threat of harm to either themselves or others. So um, we could have a suicidal subject or we could have someone who is, you know, threatening to harm others either with a firearm or with any type of weapon. That is an opportunity for our deputies and detectives to use a tool. It's not, not an arrest. It is an opportunity for us to remove those, those firearms from the home. It is a court order. It's not something that we're just going in there and taking those. We actually work very closely with our general counsel here at the sheriff's office, and they actually have an attorney who goes and represents each one of our risk protection cases and presents it before the judge and the judge is the one who makes the final determination on whether or not that order will stand. And really, we, we use that tool as a, as a temporary, temporary fix. You know, a lot of times it's, it's an opportunity for folks to hit that reset button yeah. and, you know, kind of think about, hey, maybe that wasn't such a good idea for me to, you know, to make those statements or get involved in that. And it's, it's an opportunity for them to, to reevaluate where they are. And we've had, we've had a lot of success with that. And initially we, we compiled these, these reports and it was a very early threat assessment where we were looking at what's, what's going on with this individual. So in order to get a risk protection order, there's a couple factors that you have to meet. You can't be a juvenile and you can't be a felon. Mm -hmm. um, those are kind of the bigger ones that, uh, that really jump out and, our role is compiling the criminal history. What what's going on with that individual? Is there is there stuff that has occurred previously? Are there mm -hmm. similar instances that have been reported? Is this an ongoing issue or is this a one-time thing? And a, a lot of times what we see with these is this is a one-time thing. This is a yeah. one-off where people have bad days and you know, we're here to, you know, to kind of help find a way to get that, that person out of that, that pattern of behavior. And we work with not just our, our risk protection, but, you know, again, we, we have mental health that, that we work with a lot. And we actually have, we had one here over the past, past year where every year they go up for reevaluation by our general counsel. So they'll look at it and say, 
yeah, we need to we need to go forward. Maybe there's additional law enforcement contacts or there's just something still concerning within that individual's history that really triggers that, you know, we need to go beyond the the norm and petition the judge for for more time. And this particular one, I um, kind of heard a, a little bit of a scuttle out in the in the squad bay. And I'm like, well, what, are, what are they talking about? And my office is kind of this kind of the side. And there's always stuff going on on the squad bay. Mm-hmm. The analysts are always talking about something. And I hear this. Well, she's just living her best life. And I'm like, well, what are they talking about? So now they've got, you know, they've got my ears, ears perked up a little bit. And they were actually talking about one of our respondents in the risk protection order. And it was one of those where, you know, we had a great successful outcome with it. And she had she had been been a been a subject of an RPO. She had made some threats and really threats of self harm. And she was was an older older woman, definitely not not in her twenties or anything like that, but she had gotten herself cleaned up, lost a lot of weight, started dressing better, started doing her hair, and you could tell that she was just doing much better. Her law enforcement contacts ceased. Um, we actually had a, a driver's license photo of her, and you could see that she was really taking pride in in who she was and, you know, what she was doing. And it was one of those where, you know, we were happy to say that the, the risk protection order worked for her. And it was, it was you know, kind of a happy, happy ending where we got her the help that she needed. We got her to kind of have that that reevaluation of of her, you know, her decisions and and make better decisions as a result. That is a good one. I mean, mm-hmm. and 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 the risk protection orders was another one of those things that that really came out of uh, m- when I initially kind of explained when those mass casualty incidents happened. It, it came out of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Act that the Florida Legislature passed in March of 2018 in direct response to Parkland. Uh, but it is a situation where you have a lot of people that have access to firearms and other weapons, and if you're saying something or, or you do something that is concerning, the least we could do is just a little bit of due diligence to make sure to evaluate whether it's legitimate or not and temporarily remove those weapons if, if need be. And, and Sheriff said it a, a dozen times, there's no doubt um, you know, you look back at, at legislation and, and different things that happen, that that's one that's, that's effective and it makes a difference and it saves lives because a lot of it is, um, it's not simple, but it can be simply prevented uh, if they don't have access to, because they're not necessarily willing to go as far as others. And if you can catch a couple of those that would otherwise fall between the cracks, it's, it's worth it. So what other uh, big success stories do you guys have? Oh, Anything? Goodness. I know there's a lot. There's some we can't talk about, but any that you can? Um, let's see here. So we have um, we have one that that was it was a pretty. We have, I'll talk to you about two. I'll hmm. Give you two. Mm-hmm. Um, two very early on successes for us. Um, one stemmed from domestic violence, and that's one that's really difficult for for us. You know, we we talked about this this crystal ball, this perception that we have this crystal ball and we know what's coming next. And we really don't. And this one stemmed from domestic violence. And it was initially, you, you can see the progression as, as we got to, you know, reading through this individual's history, you could see how, how everything had really started to spiral. And he was actually in custody at the time when he came on our radar he had attempted to contact her 150 times from our from our jail oh. and he really started he started making plans for for them and talking mm-hmm. about how we're we're going to we're going to move away together we're you know we're when i get out of here we're we're fleeing the the area um, he had some personal artifacts of hers that he somehow got in the jail with him, oh. um, which were, were permissible in the jail. But, um, you know, he, he talked about those, those artifacts and, um, it was a lock of her hair that he somehow got in the jail that he kept, um, he kept it in a sock and used it as a oh. bookmark. Um, and it was just really, um, oh really scary stuff on, you know, him continuing to contact her. And it was, it it was a long stint that he continued in, in jail. Um, and 
here we are, we're two years later, and there was some contact that occurred where the detective did some follow-up on it. And with the follow-up, um, we got her away from him, obviously. We got her into a domestic violence shelter, got her out of the situation. Um, the situation had gotten bad enough that he had actually battered her, her child with a wrench, uh, oh. um, had broken into the house and, and come after her, and the child attempted to you know, defend her, and he had actually yeah. struck the child with the wrench. Um, so it was really, it was just, God. it was a lose-lose situation for, for everyone involved. And after, after a period of time and after, you know, going through the threat management process, um, they followed up with him to, you know, see how he was doing, see how things were progressing. And of course we followed up with her as well. Um, she's actually doing really well. She's away from him. And most importantly, he now acknowledges, you know, hey, that that just wasn't a good look for me. It wasn't it wasn't healthy for me. It wasn't healthy for her. I have no desire to go back to her. Um, I, I can confidently say it has been a an extended period of time since they have had contact. And, you know, that that was, you know, a happy, happy story for us where we could say that, you know, we we were successful in getting, you know, those two apart and, you know, they've both been able to live better lives as a result of it. And he doesn't still have the hair bookmark. I don't know what I happened hope. to the hair. You really had me concerned when you started talking about artifacts. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My mind was starting to wander. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not I can see the wheels turning and I'm <laughs> yeah, like, oh, okay, let me just clarify uh, this. Turning, yeah. um, mm -hmm. All right. So, and, and that was a case where she was, she initiated the, the so, report. Yes. Or, so it, yeah. it came to us as a, it came as a domestic violence um, injunction violation. So mm -hmm. she had the injunction against him and he continued to violate that injunction by continuing to call her. And, you know, she made the notification to us through patrol, which then triggered for the analyst review. And then, you know, kind of followed that process all the way through over to the detective side where they, they went ahead and took that for investigation. That's... 150 times from jail yeah like that's within a lot of money isn't it uh, that's what i was thinking yeah. I was like you or can't you just not, make a does it not cost money unless they answer i don't know does it cost money can mm -hmm. you just call people all day i wouldn't think so from jail i don't think so it's not how it is on tv right so well i mean we way. also solve everything in 30 minutes on tv it's true over commercial breaks yeah all right okay. so that's yeah. a good one what else you got um another one um let's see here Ooh, do we want to talk about do we want to talk about a stalking case or do we want to talk about a stalking case? Stalking case. That's definitely the stalking always, case. It's always the stalking yeah. cases, right? Um, this particular one, um, this was pretty cool for the analysts. This was where we we really went above and beyond in, in both of these, actually. Um, we, we got in an initial report of a... It was, again, it was another domestic situation. Um, that's just, it's one of those where... It provides us a glimpse into the home, and uh, he he was having having some conversations with his his ex wife. They were estranged, and he was up in he was out of state, up in Ohio, and basically had they had a, an ongoing dispute. And he said, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm coming down," and it's like, "What? what? I'm coming down, and I'm 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 armed, and I'll I'll be down there tomorrow." And the analyst um, not only identified the report and referred that over for the threat management detectives to look at, but she went a step further and said, okay, well, he plans to be here tomorrow. He's not driving from Ohio, so how's he getting here? And she actually ended up pulling up all of the flights and looked at all the different flights coming into both uh, Tampa International and as well as St. Pete Clearwater found a flight that was actually coming in the following morning. I believe it landed at like 930. And we had detectives there to make contact with him and see, you know, what what exactly his intentions were. Um, and we were we were able to intercept that before he was ever even able to get to her. Yeah. So those obviously are are great outcomes. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about as we kind of wind down, I, I want to learn about the dynamic uh, among all the analysts. Um, it's a it's a unique job you know we did some uh, promoting on social media to, to try to to try to get some analysts because we had some openings at one point mm -hmm. um, but we we joked about you know hey if, if, if you really like to 
this probably is not the appropriate time to say this, but stalk your exes on social media. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, you know, yeah. or yeah. if you have that FBI <laughs> yeah. friend, yeah, that's that, kind that of the friend, angle I went yeah. for. That friend that can find dirt on anybody. Yeah, that's, in, yeah. in a more in a more harmless way. Yes, um, that's that's the kind of job. But you guys seem to be really close knit. Even though, I mean, how many analysts are there total? including so the embedded ones. This this past year, we went from 17 analysts to now we're up to 21. Oh, nice. um, huge explosion of growth for us. And it's it's really been attributed to, you know, as you mentioned, the, the Stone and Douglas Commission. Yeah. There has been so much that has come out from, from a threat management perspective, a school safety perspective, as well as a community threat management perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, within threat management, we're we're really focused on on all of those, and that really bleeds into our role with an ILP. So it's been really exciting to watch the growth that's occurred within within the unit and and the buy-in. Mm -hmm. You know, we we talked early on about you know back back in 2006. Right. You know, we we weren't getting that buy-in. We were you know we were kind of struggling to really pioneer and, and pave the way. And you know, I can confidently say there are there are a lot of analysts who who started with me in 2006 and and some who who are still on who were there before me mm -hmm. and you know a lot of times we'll we'll sit around the water cooler and talk about you know how far it's come mm -hmm. and it's really really neat to see the dynamic in the unit because we do we have a lot of we have a lot of senior members mixed with a lot of brand new members and you know the senior members really bring that institutional knowledge, and mm -hmm. they they know where we came from, right? Yeah. They they came up through the ranks, and you know they they have the blood, sweat, and the tears to to show for it. And then we have this this newer group of folks who are coming on, who we've been we've really been able to really be selective now mm -hmm. about who who we're bringing on. No more are the days that you know we're we're bringing on the person fresh out of college that. Uh, so you wouldn't be hired now. If no, you were I, now. I'm sad to say I'd be out of a job <laughs> for sure. Uh. But we we bring on these really you know really intelligent folks who have great experience, military experience, other law enforcement experience, and they they do a great job. And and we all come together in this really neat dynamic where. We can talk through processes. We can talk through ideas. We, you know, we all have different experiences and different life experiences that we can bring to the table, and it's it's really neat to see it all unfold and and see how everyone has something that they can contribute to to the process and to the the scope of the unit as a whole. And I, I it's ever evolving because when, you, when you're when you talk about people that are innovative and, and thinking new ideas I remember when it first uh, came back together several years ago I think uh, lieutenant Kurt Romanowski was kind of handed that I think he was sergeant promoted lieutenant and took that and that was always a new thing and, and we had him present to a couple different uh, uh, of our public education groups and he always showed a clip I think it was the clip from uh, Apollo 13 where yes. it, 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 it was kind of corny, but it was perfect when he oh. used it because it, whenever uh, it was for the part in the movie where they had to figure out how to get them, they were in a bad situation mm -hmm. to fix it. Anyway, they just dumped all this stuff and to these engineers said, hey, we got to figure out how to make this, do this. I mean, it's, it's, but I feel like it's probably like that every day. Every, every time, day. Every, because you, you said it earlier and I, I thought that was exactly right is that you have all these tools, you know, you're not, you, you're not, you're doing incredible things, but it's nothing extraordinary. You're just taking tools and things that we already have to put it together to make it work. And you do have to have groups of people around that are willing to, to sit around and, you know, talk about fun things like your favorite flavor of ice cream and then shift gears and, you know, get down to business. So um, on the analysts, um, I, I foresee there, the, as time goes on here, I see different positions in areas of the agency where it's like, oh, man, every time there's an opening there, like, bam, it's, it's filled because it's a desirable place to be. And I feel like that's. I think that's threat now with the analysts. Oh yeah, we we love it. We you know we have folks who who come in you know constantly. Hey, what what can I do? Mm -hmm. What you know what what'll get me through the through the door? And you know that's from from my perspective. That's just, that's so rewarding to right. see that we have you know such a following yeah. that you know people want to be involved in this and yeah, want to be a part of it. They'll take a they'll take a position just to get their foot in the door so they yeah. can transfer yeah. over. So when you do have that rare opening, uh, who, what are you looking for in an analyst? Rock stars. 
rock stars. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, somebody who is is willing to change. We mm. we change a lot. We grow a lot, and you know, which that, is not a thing that law enforcement likes to do. No, <laughs> that no. scary c word. Uh, it is it is very scary. Um, but we we really look for you know someone who's willing to look beyond the surface value. You know, we we do not like to do things the same just because you know it's always it's, been done that way. Yeah, it's cliche. Mm. You know, it's a big thing that we always say within the agency. Well, it's always been done that way. Yeah, right. you know. It's it's true for us though. You know, we we constantly have to look at new ways to do stuff. Um, we we put analysts through a ton of training. We actually partner with FDLE's Analyst Academy, where we get them almost 260 hours of of training, uh-huh. where they're wow. sitting in classrooms, going through practical exercises, completing quizzes. We actually have two analysts who are due to graduate in June, where you know that's. That's our third batch to go through of, mm-hmm. of analysts. So, you know, our goal is to get everybody through that. But really, um, education-wise, we, we look for that bachelor's degree, you know, any, any sort of criminology or related field, we're looking for that. And experience. Law enforcement experience is, is huge for us. And any sort of analytical experience, you mm-hmm. know, we've, we've had folks who are military intelligence come in we've had folks who we've actually had a couple of interns who started out as interns with us and came into the agency and said hey you know what i i don't i don't care how i get there i just i want to get there mm-hmm. and we've had a couple who have come in as our administrative assistants mm-hmm. and i mean they're like sponges they they want to uh-huh. learn everything that there is to know about analytics and they they literally you know found found their way through through shadowing and just learning about the position to to get in there. Um, we have folks who have come from other law enforcement agencies. We have one that actually came from. We've had two two from California, one from Arizona. So I mean we're we're bringing them from across the country with with yeah. great great diversity and great experience. We're in. we're doing something really unique, I think. I would, yeah. I've seen the writing on the wall on that for a while. I mean, we all have from where we sit upstairs like this is this is awesome. Nobody else is doing this and I'm glad that people are, are catching on to it because really I always am an advocate for the civilians in the support roles that uh, make everybody look good and the analysts are definitely that is that bunch. You guys do unbelievable work nobody knows it it's not appreciated uh, as much as it should be and it's that's saying a lot because you guys are very appreciated and recognized and i think just you allow everybody to do their job more efficiently uh they allow us to take on more cases that we probably wouldn't even be able to touch because it's like yeah i mean that's something we like to deal with but how but you mm-hmm. know y'all make it happen and of course those very serious cases we are able to handle those a lot quicker so um no question, PR is a big fan of, uh, of oh, the yeah. analysts. They have always, mm-hmm. always some cool stuff for us. So that's enough about work. Um, oh, here comes the hard-hitting questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here we go. So, Let me shift in my seat. So there, there are, are a couple other people in this agency that have the same last name as you. Yeah, there's a uh, few. One of them is uh, your husband, uh, Greg, who's a captain. Uh, and the other is your brother-in-law, uh, Dave, who's one of our assistant chief deputies. So it really is a family business. Yeah. So how, how did this how did this happen? You know, it's not very smart to marry deputies, I've heard. Uh, but how, how did this go down? Were you we all together before you started here? How did, how did this all work? And I want to talk about that, that dynamic. Oh, boy. And we're not going to let him come in here, rebut it at least for a while. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is this is how it all began. Um, I obviously uh, took took the position, had no idea what I was getting into and. I used to uh, I used to run on the beach. That was my favorite thing to do after work. I mm-hmm. didn't have any responsibilities and have any kids or anything. I'm like, yeah, let's go run on the beach. This is fun. This mm-hmm. is beautiful out here. Every uh-huh. every night I'd go run at sunset. And uh, one night I had just uh, just gotten out of gotten out, gotten out of work. Probably just gotten out of one of those uh, pro star comstat meetings, getting yelled at about <laughs> you know something. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got in, got into a fender bender and mm. no big deal. You know, I I was like, yeah, I'm kind of in a rough area. Let me. Let me just call Com Center and see if uh, you know if they can send somebody by. Um, I I naively thought that you know we would work the crash right, not that FHP would be coming. So um, she sent uh, the dispatcher sent me a deputy, and uh, lo and behold, two two deputies get out mm-hmm. of the car, and I'm I'm kind of confused by this. You know, I've only been here for a couple months, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of trying to piece together who's who and whatnot, and. I'm kind of getting frustrated with the guy who, you know, had had actually run into the back of me, and uh, he walks up to to one of the guys, and they they were both both nice looking young men, 
I can say that now, right? They're young men. We were yeah, young yeah, at the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And you're um, talking about the two deputies. Yes. The two, okay. Yeah. yeah. And and he, being the person that ran into you, walked up with the two deputies. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, they they kind of have this this dialogue, and um, the uh, the citizen looks looks at one of the deputies and says, "Hey, man, you got on the SWAT pen. You on the SWAT team?" And this one deputy, you know, dark. There was a a deputy with a, a dark features and deputy with light features and uh the one with the darker features answers well yeah I'm not just wearing the pen i'm like wow this guy's, <laughs> this guy's really full of it you know mm -hmm. and i'm like oh, what a jerk you know forget about it um yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry greg <laughs> and uh yeah it, it turns out uh 16 years later we're uh we're married two kids and uh it, it worked out um family uh family dinners have never really been the same ever since mm -hmm. you know we kind of all got together my my mother-in-law actually retired from the sheriff's office um i want to say two or three years after um after i started mm -hmm. so it's um it's always always run run deep for the uh the dancing family yeah and and we'll get we'll get greg in here eventually and, and his brother mm -hmm. we're either going to do the two of them together or the two assistant chiefs because they're hilarious but um so what's that dynamic like i mean over over the years obviously he wasn't a captain when you met um if he was you probably wouldn't be sitting here right now he'd be something <laughs> else and you'd be living on an island somewhere but uh so how is that what has that dynamic been like i mean you're, you're kind of the you know now you're you're really you're really his backup and in, in in some in some ways for his deputies i'm i'm the lowest ranking member in the family <laughs> <laughs> And, well, the uh, most useful, though, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's been it's been interesting to to watch that dynamic fold unfold over the years, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's it's been really cool because I've I've kind of been in the same spot over the years, so I've I've kind of really really developed this this expertise, whereas he's had the ability to go around to a lot of different components, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know there are a lot of times where. You know, we'll sit and talk through stuff and be like, yeah, you know, I've really got this, this, you know, this one problem at work and I don't know how to deal with it. And I'm like, well, hey, we, we can help out with that. You can? Like, do you <laughs> still listen surprised? to anything that I say? <laughs> you never <laughs> listen, Greg. Uh, <laughs> it's true. So, you know, and, and vice versa, you know, I'll, I'll be sitting talking about something. He's like, you know, do, do you ever listen to anything that I say? And I'm like, well, you know, sometimes. But, Maybe we just uh, need to bring him on, you, both of you. We can work some of these things out. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm really good at mediating <laughs> that. Can Irish counseling now? Yeah. yeah. Can, we, can we get those, like, giant uh, inflatable box, boxing gloves? Uh -huh. Yeah, fun. make it really just interesting. Down on the platform or something, yeah. too? Yeah. That's fun. So, um, no, it's, it's, it's been, been really good, you know, where we do, we, we thankfully haven't ever had to work directly. I think the closest thing that we've ever had was, was Hurricane Irma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The analysts always find their way into all of these disaster situations. <laughs> right. You know, COVID, we were here with our gloves on, piecing through, you know, all of these paper, paper handwritten copies of these business I helped checks. with that. I did. Oh, God. <laughs> you remember that? And we're like, oh, I can't mm -hmm. type with these gloves. Yeah, they, they asked the admins and patrol to help. <laughs> yeah, we, we had no idea what we were getting into there. Yeah. So, you know, we were we were trying to be extra careful. You didn't know in the beginning. But, uh, yeah, we um, we worked the the traffic stuff in, in Irma. So mm -hmm. we had a bunch of intersections that were down and, and closed down for, you know, either damage to the intersection or the traffic lights being out and you weren't actually directing traffic you were like mapping where the outages were yeah <laughs> okay. yeah okay. yeah yeah they're pretty good at the mapping is, is yeah. what they do the mapping was the key for us you know <laughs> well, I, it's a disaster they might you yeah, know it, it would be know. a disaster if i was out there directing traffic <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh yeah you know we 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 had the opportunity to to work together and you know i kind of got to see him you know come up with with some ideas and he got to kind of feel and see some of, you know, some of the frustrations that we deal with with some of the technology. The technology is great mm -hmm. when it's working. Right. Yeah. And when it's not working, it is not great. And in that that particular instance, our, our technology was not working to our advantage. So, you know, he got to got to see some of that firsthand. And, you know, of course, I've gotten to work with my brother in law over the years, mm -hmm. which, you know, has always made for an interesting you know dynamic. You mm -hmm. know. And I know, I know, I know what y'all's ranks are here in this building. But you know, when we step outside, you yeah. know, remember we're <laughs> right. we're equal. And uh, hey, we're, uh, we still got to break bread on Sunday. But 
it's uh, it's it's been a, a lot of fun. It's been been a fun ride to uh, you know see all of our careers unfold. You know, mm-hmm. when I when I first started, my brother in law was a sergeant. My husband was a was a deputy, and um, my mother in law was was actually a um, she was in IOB, and back then they transcribed all of the interviews. Mm. So mm-hmm. she was actually in charge of actually typing all of that out. And, you know, it's just crazy. I, I don't think I would have the patience for that. Mm. <laughs> I no. feel like you guys are mumbling into the microphone. Uh, Stop it. Yeah, well, that's, uh, th- but yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation is, you know, what happens if we have to go back to, to pen and paper, <laughs> if something happens and what happens, you know, we're, we're all, we're all going to be in the fetal position somewhere. Hey, so, I, I, I am curious about one thing. How did he actually win you over when you, how do you go from jerk to uh <sighs> Oh yeah. So, so you can leave it to Laura to I know. We gotta go back yeah, to that. She, she's, she's working on the, the love connection, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm. So <laughs> the human interest side. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I ended up sending an email to to both of them just as a you know courtesy thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, I was didn't really it's kind of cliche, I didn't really know how to find them or figure out where they were. They were in patrol. I didn't know, you know, I can't get on the radio and be like, hey, thanks. <laughs> and send them, send them a quick email and go figure is a dark featured one bit, right? He was the first one to be like, oh yeah, no problem. And we kind of struck up a conversation and realized we lived less than a half a mile from each other. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he had picked up on, you know, obviously that I was going running that day. And he's like, you know, do you want to go for a jog sometime? And I'm like, yeah, Mm -hmm. okay, okay, fine. And yeah, it was, it was from that. There was a, there was one single run that we went on in the neighborhood. And then it was like, it was, it was every day we were inseparable. You you faster Mm -hmm. than he is? No. Uh, no, no. Remember that SWAT pen? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right, right. you're either SWAT or you're not, and yeah. I'm not SWAT. You're not, not SWAT. <laughs> but yeah, he's 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 a really good guy, and I've I've always admired them that about him. That you know he has that ability to to treat people equally. You know, I think he's kind of seen all sides of the agency, just from where Dave's been, where I've been, where he's been, mm-hmm. and you know he he sees the value that that everyone brings, and yeah. he's he's always able to just. I think it's, that that, it's like that generational thing you're talking about as yeah. you come up over time, you know, it kind of changes. And, um, we were, we were all, I was, I was sad when he, uh, got transferred out of special ops to where he is now, because it, he was like, th- there's only a handful of people in this agency in the time that I've been here that I've thought about just trying to come up with the most outlandish idea possible to pitch it just to hear him say, Oh yeah, sure. Like <laughs> if I said, I want to strap Brennan to the skids of the helicopter, he'd have been like, Oh yeah, let's do it. You know, <laughs> you know like, it was just wait for, for filming purposes or just for funsies. D- either. Honestly, oh, yeah. if I said, Hey, you know, Brennan lost a bet and we got to strap him to the skid of the helicopter. He'd be like, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. It's what time I'll let Brian know. And we'll, we'll do it. You know, it was just, just a great sport. So we'll stop Absolutely. before we all get in trouble with him. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. kicks yeah. the door in or something. Remember I got go home yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so you mentioned you have a couple kids and and so those are hobbies obviously but yeah. but what else it, it, you, you still run on the beach together no no? no we're too old for that now yeah, yeah. no now now I spend my time walking on a uh, walking on a golf course with my with my kids so I've All got right. got two two kiddos that love to play golf and really? uh, got got one that's really really into it right now and um, I had to learn everything that there is to know about golf so you're caddy I'm a caddy. That's awesome. <laughs> it's the most terrifying thing in the world. Being a caddy? Really? Yes. Really? Oh, I feel like there's so much weight on my shoulders, right? And, well, there is. And you feel yeah. you feel their pressure, mm. and it's uh, it's really cool. It's it's a unique time that that I get to spend with both my boys, and mm. you know, it's it's something that I'll I'll forever cherish. That you know, I get to spend all those hours out, out on the course with them and watch them develop and watch them grow and, and tournaments and, and all that fun stuff. Oh yeah, the tournaments yeah. are intense. Nine-year-old tournaments, woo! Uh-huh. It's a big deal, guys. It's a big deal. I think I've seen some videos, either you or maybe Greg have posted, of mm-hmm. his swing, and I'm like, I, I, I mean, I'm not a golfer. I, I can't wrap my head around hitting a ball away from me and walking after it, but, um, <laughs> I, I mean, even they trying golf carts? A, Yeah, but, I mean, even <laughs> even trying, like, a top golf, like, uh, that kid has got exceptional form. I, I, I can't do it. I don't I don't know where he got his hand eye coordination from. It's not me. It's not Greg. And neither I, of you play golf? No, no, not at all. I I I had never picked up a golf club before he started and I still I still don't play. I, I try and he makes fun of me and insults <laughs> me and I'm like, I'm done. I wow. don't need this kind of humiliation. <laughs> wow. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, I thanks hope, for I having me. I hope we don't get you in too much trouble. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been nice working with you guys. <laughs> I don't know. We've talked you up enough. There's no way he could. There's no, you, you're going to be here. Nothing we can do about that. No way out of it. <laughs> He'll just have to get over it. Um, appreciate you taking the time coming on. Yeah. yeah. Sharing. There, we, I could talk about that stuff all day because I think it's just so fascinating. And it, it is. It's, yeah. it's really, uh, you all allow us to do things we could never do before and, and really um, just close cases and, and get stuff done. Like there's just so much that goes on. And I wish, I wish everybody would take the time to learn about it because it's, it's really unbelievable. And we'll, we'll, we'll get somebody, maybe Captain Camacho, we'll get somebody in here to talk, you know, kind of more, more about threat. I know that's not all your wheelhouse, but they are doing some, some really awesome things. So thanks again. And please let, uh, well, I know you have your, your, all your fangirls listening. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, but make sure want, they want all to know. Shout out that. to anybody? Yeah. Oh, any, uh, shout out to all of them. All of them. See, you yeah. can't pick favorites. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's recorded. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. so we always ask our guests if there's anything that you want the public to know uh, that we didn't cover or anything the public can do uh, to help you. Ooh. So I have a feeling I know the answer, yeah. Uh, yeah. but this is your time. Hmm. What do I need from the public? Uh, we're here to support the public. We cannot do what we do every day without the public. You know, it, it comes down to, yeah, we talked about, you know, lock your car doors and everything, but there are eyes and ears, you know, constantly, you mentioned early on, you know, we, we see these, these events unfold on, on television and, and we ask, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it boils down to, we don't know what we don't know. We depend mm -hmm. on that that contact from the community, you know, we, we depend on that communication. If something's off and something doesn't seem right and someone needs help, again, not an arrest, but they need help. Mm -hmm. We're here, you know, we're, we're here to help with that. And, you know, we, we work a lot with the schools. We work a lot with our community-based partners and every one of us sitting in those seats feels very passionately about making sure that everybody comes home safe at night. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, not just our law enforcement officers, but the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to make sure that everybody sends their kids to school and feel safe. Everyone goes to work and feels safe. That's that's a right that we all have to to feel safe in our daily lives. And, you know, my mission is to find ways to make it to where everyone feels that safety. And mm -hmm. if they don't you know, call us, talk to us. You know, we, we have resources available to, to help folks. And, you know, we have the resources to, to get folks connected and, and get them the help that they need. That's perfect. Yeah. That is, that is more than lock your doors. That's very yeah, good. Absolutely. And what, um, is that like our non-emergency line? Sure. Or so uh, it, it all depends on, on, you know, what you're dealing with. If you're dealing mm -hmm. with something that, that is exigent and we need somebody there right now, you know, of course, we, we always yeah. have, you know, we always have 911 to, to help people out. And unfortunately, there are there are a lot of situations where, you know, it just escalates to that automatically. But mm -hmm. we do. We have our have our non-emergency line where, you know, you can reach out. We can have, you know, deputies respond out and kind of take that initial initial contact, see what's going on, you know, kind of kind of get to the bottom. Of it. We also have our mental health folks who can come out and, and help out with the mental health side of things. So, you know, we we have a lot of tools here within the sheriff's office to to make sure that, that folks get what they need. But they definitely they got to reach out and let us know. You know we're we're here to help, but we got to know that there's a problem first. You have a unique perspective and see the resources that are out there, so people don't realize they're there. I mean, I know the resources that I'm not aware of, and I'm yeah. I'm here every day. We're in it, you know, and there's stuff. Mm -hmm. So very good, yeah. good stuff. I think sometimes people think that you know they think I don't know they uh, somebody said something that's concerning, but it's not at the level of like I need to call 911. It was an open threat, mm -hmm. um, but to know that they can call our non-emergency line and know that it's Get documented and yeah. that it could potentially prevent something that could lead to that. Yeah. And if, if, if you don't want to talk to somebody, we have tip lines, we mm. have, you know, we have tons of tips, uh, tip outputs available. We have uh, stuff on our public site that we can utilize. We also have, um, partnerships that we communicate with through our school board with see something say something fortify mm -hmm. florida you know if there's if there's something out there that you know that's a problem or is a concern ship it to us we'll take a look at it and, you know chances are it's going to fall fall on my desk at some point where you know we can we can look at it and see if it is something that that needs a further further look good stuff yeah ashley what else do i have to do to wrap up the show 
What else do you have to do? I, I have I have a I mean, part. she has a part. Laura has a part. I rehearse yeah, all this, the time. This is my first time. This is my first time. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, well, so we, let's start we, with, we, go ahead. we really want to hear how um, how the listeners feel about the show, what they think, if they have any questions, if they have any comments, corrections, mm -hmm. criticisms, anything they want to tell us, suggestions for future shows. And the way to reach us is at let's56 at pcsonet.com. That's L-E-T-S-5-6 at pcsonet.com. We want to hear from you. Yes, please reach out to us. We want to hear from you. We appreciate mm -hmm. the feedback we've gotten. Uh, and again, we appreciate you, Jacqueline, for joining us. Thank yeah. you so and, much. Uh, yeah. thank, thank you all you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.